Thank you all very much for being here. Um, everybody knows Senator Voinovich. I'm not going to do the long introduction, Thank you. except to say that uh, somebody who has been a mayor of a great city and helped write the finances, who's been the governor of a great state and helped write the finances, has been a wonderful senator. I wish you were going to stick around to help write our finances here, especially having heard and read what you've been doing in the past few weeks. Uh, it is our great honor and pleasure to have you here. Uh, I think you've been a longtime member of the Aspen family, and certainly your values, I hope, are what Aspen values are. So let me just start by um, leaping right into it and ask about some of the lessons you've learned uh, uh, before you uh, retire. Well, first of all, uh, there's so many people around the table that I know and uh, want to acknowledge you. <laughs> And some of you have been very, very helpful to me, and uh, as cousins, we go back to the days when we got the waivers for the uh, welfare legislation. If we hadn't got the waivers, we would not have had a re the reform of the wonderful reform we had of our welfare system. So uh, I uh, am very, very grateful to uh, to Aspen, and uh, where's Dick Clark at? Just over here. And Dick, uh, I just want to say that your team uh, has done a fantastic job in terms of the logistics of our, our, our meetings, uh, with the quality of uh, our scholars and experts. Uh, and, and I say this from the perspective of, you know, as president of the National League of Cities and, uh, Na and chairman of the National Governors Association, so I've gone through lots of meetings over the years, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and I know. <laughs> You're saying he does it better than the National League of Cities? I think he does. Wow. I think this is, no, I'm, I'm Bill Nell gets the credit. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, and Bill has been great, and Diane, and the, 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 you have a great, a great group of people. And I've enjoyed the forums, and I've enjoyed the, um, uh, the breakfast that we have, uh, having an opportunity to hear from experts on subjects that are, that are, uh, that are very important uh, uh, to me. Uh, in addition, um, I think that, uh, this has given me an opportunity to uh, get some insight in terms of my priorities in the, in the Senate, uh, help me to be more informed in my decisions uh, regarding legislation and policy positions. In addition to that, it's also given me an opportunity to get to know my colleagues better. I know all of us are real concerned about what's going on in terms of our relationships in the Senate and the House, and I think that uh, through the Aspen forums and through the meetings that we have, the breakfast meetings, I've gotten to know some, some really great people. I just was thinking Howard Berman and I are very good friends. Uh, uh, Ray LaHood and I got to, got to know each other through this organization. Sandy Levin uh, through this organization. Uh, Nita Lowy just bought my condominium. <laughs> and, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, we got to know these folks, and, and it's been it's been wonderful. And that's uh, you know Jimmy Oberstar. We're working on transportation. Now the agenda that I think one of your somebody sent me was uh, lessons learned after four decades in public service. In addition, foreign policy issues. Attendants will seek your thoughts on energy policy, climate policy, government management, and the status of political discourse in America. <laughs> Uh, and I can tell you that uh, the Dick Clark will tell you that uh, glad, he's glad that we have the three-minute rule <laughs> because when I get wind, wound up, he's got to call me <laughs> or the one-minute intervention. These, the, the way these minis are run, it's, it's uh, just super. So what lessons learned real quick. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, to participate in as many forums uh, like you have uh, is very, very valuable. So it, I have to say that the time spent in Aspen, those meetings, probably the best spent time in, in terms of the Senate. And there's been some other think tanks that have been involved in the German Marshall Fund, and there are things overseas in Brussels, but they've been, they've given you the, the, the real understanding, you get, they put you in the bathtub, okay, and you really know what's going on. And that's important from uh, your decision making. But it's also very important, I think, uh, from the point of view of the herd mentality that we have. What happens is, is that uh, you have a conference, somebody gets up and starts saying, this is the way it is, and then all of a sudden everybody says, well, that's the way it is. And to be able to say, look, I was there, I heard the experts, and here's another point of view, folks, on, uh, on this situation. That's, that's extremely important. 
uh, national organizations. Uh, I would urge every individual in this country to get involved in national organizations. The National League of Cities, uh, the National Governors Association have been, not only has it helped my city and my state, but it's been very, very helpful in pushing issues across that are important to, uh, to America. Remember our unfunded mandates legislation, welfare legislation, all of these things. When we were active in the big six or big seven, uh, and we had, every, we had all the governors working together in a bipartisan, we had all the state and local government people, and, and, and I have to tell you that, that we, we got, I said, if we go down there, state, local, Democrat, Republican to Congress, we can get things done. And uh, back in, uh, let's see, 70, maybe not would it be, 397, 98, uh, the, that, that coalition was ranked 25th most powerful in terms of influence in, uh, uh, in Congress. And we didn't, give any, uh, didn't get, we didn't give anybody any campaign money. <laughs> so I think working in those groups, uh, working with the National Business Roundtable, National Alliance of Business, and, and uh, I call it the public-private partnership. Okay? To me, that's the most important uh, thing that we've got going. How do we work and galvanize all the resources, whether it be in Washington, a state level, local level, to work together and get people to understand they have a symbiotic relationship with each other, uh, collaborate, and, uh, and, and, and get things done. And uh, I was very pleased that two weeks ago that uh, the business community in Ohio got together uh, the Ohio Business Roundtable and the rest of them, and we're going to you know, set up a prize each year uh, for uh, the best public-private partnership in the state. And uh, we're going to develop a curriculum at the uh, Voinovich School for Pub Leadership in Public Affairs at Ohio University on, on the importance of, of the public-private uh, partnership. Because as uh, we get, we see more of this problem with raising money uh, for, for local government, we're going to have to go out in the community and find other resources and say this is important to the community and how do we get that, get that done? How do we galvanize? I oh, say government's one thread in the fabric of the community. The object is to go out and get all the resources and pull them together and, uh, and make things happen. Uh, leadership, uh, public service begins with listening, prioritizing. Leadership uh, wants to make things, get, get things done. Uh, leadership is the tenacity to, uh, uh, to finish the job. Uh, management and, and good finances. Any good business has what? Good finances and good people. And uh, in terms of finances, uh, <laughs> I dealt with them in Cleveland with the default. I dealt with a billion and a half dollars on the, on the state level. And right now, unfortunately, what I tried to do on the federal level, we're still and I'll talk, if some of you may want to ask a question about where, where I think we are in terms of tax reform and, and, and really getting our, uh, this. Uh, why, why don't we ask that now? I mean, I know you're in favor of the. Well, why don't you go ahead and, uh, if you want, yeah. you want to, I'll, I'll be glad. I mean, I'd love to know, because yeah. you know, I know you came out in favor of what the Deficit Commission did, but how do we get from here to there? <clears throat> well, I think we have to blow up the place. Uh, there's a big debate going on right now, and um, most people want to, uh, work an agreement, they're going to extend it, some deal will be made. Uh, my concern is that we have this almost crescendo that's coming out, and I believe that if we, I call it, kick the can down the road, that the tax reform that I've been working on for, since George Bush and, and, uh, and uh, got together with with, uh, with John Bro and Connie Mack, who, by the way, did a fantastic job of coming back with some tax reform, and then it got, it just was, was on the shelf over at the White House. They, President Bush didn't do anything with it. I'm afraid that we'll just kick it down, the can down the road, we won't see the tax reform, we won't see uh, the, uh, any, any control of real spending, and uh, the closer we get to 2012, the more difficult it will become. And so you'd vote against the extension? I'm going to vote against, I'm, I'm voting against everything. I am. Okay. Uh, you just, I, I have learned in my life that you can't get anything done unless you've got a crisis. I'd never been able to do what I did in Cleveland without a crisis in the state level. I would never have been able to do anything without, without you got to have a crisis. Everybody will just raise hell. Business, people, everybody. Got to do something about it. And they won't be able to get away with it. They'll say, got to do something about it now, not later. 
So that's my feeling in regard to, to that issue. Um, good management, uh, you know, you're only as good as your team. And uh, one of the things that, you know, you've got to select the right people, got to train them. Uh, you got to stay on top of them. And uh, this is 30 years that I've done weekly reports. When I became mayor, I got weekly reports from everybody, every single week. And I've been doing that when I was mayor, I did it as governor, and I do it as senator. It's, it's, you're the orchestra leader, and you want to know what's happening in the sections of the orchestra. So they come in with the reports, you read them over. When I was governor, on Monday I'd get together with the leader of the Senate, and the House Speaker, and we would talk about, you know, what, how are we doing, what are we doing, what's going on, that kind of thing. I think that's extremely important, and uh, I'm a great believer in total quality management. If I, if I look back on my career as governor, it's, uh, it's the public-private partnership and total quality management. <coughs> and I wanted to bring that to, to the federal government. And it, it just, you know, uh, when I left the state of Ohio, we had uh, 3,000 continuing improvement teams 1,200 facilitators, and I thought I'd be able to bring that here, Walter. And then I got involved in the fact that we had this crisis in terms of people coming to work for the federal government, and thank God for Joe Nye up at Harvard. Joe made uh, Human Capital a executive session. We had four sessions on it. We got people together all over the country, and for the last 10 years, Dan Danny Akak and I have been working on trying to reform uh, Title V of the, the uh, Civil Service Act. A vision, you gotta have vision. Uh, you know, and that's one of the things that I wrote to you about. Where, where's our vision for the country? Where's our five-year plan? How do we do this thing? Do we, you know, we, we get together uh, for a day at the Library of Congress and listen to polls from people, and these are the issues that the polls say that we should be concerned about, and um, you know, Bill Frist almost got there. We, we, uh, I said, you gotta get a facilitator. So we got a guy from Harvard to come in, and for a couple of days I thought we were gonna get it. This is what I do when I was, you know, was governor with my staff, I do that. We spend a lot of time, you know, where are we going? What are the steps that we need to get there? Keep reviving that. The country needs, it needs a vision. What are we trying to achieve? And I, I know a simple thing might be to get the, the Senate together and, and, and have them spend a couple of days. These are our three top priorities. Then get the, the you know, maybe the Democrats, it'd be nice if they did it together. Get them together and then say, and then with the administration and say, we agree on one thing. Okay. Let's, let's do the one thing, or let's do the two things. And um, I'm very, very concerned uh, about that. <coughs> Legislatively, I think one lesson I've learned is pick out a subject. Get to be an expert in certain areas. Understand you can't do everything. And uh, when I came down here, I did not want to be the orchestra leader. I wanted to become uh, uh, first chair in a couple sections uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the orchestra. And so we, we try to concentrate on that. Um, when I was in the state legislature, it was the environment. I'm the father of the Ohio Vi Environmental Protection Agency. I helped organize the 12th State Legislative Committee on, on Lake Erie. Um, and lucky, I came to Congress, and uh, I've been able to continue what I refer to as the second battle of Lake Erie. And now it's the, the battle, second battle of, of the Great Lakes to restore them. But again, spending a lot of time on it. Human capital, debt, environment, nuclear, foreign policy. Uh, I've been very much in the Western Balkans, NATO expansion. Uh, uh, one of the things I've been very much involved in is uh, uh, the issue of anti-Semitism today in our, this country and in the world. And uh, we've tried to give that the kind of priority that it needs and through the OSCE. Aspen's helped me in Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Your forums on political Islam, Dick, Wonderful. Worked with I got, Luger and I teamed up on the SOFA agreement. We also teamed up on some kind of a of a exodus plan out of out of Iraq. Energy. Uh, I know everybody's disappointed on that, but uh, you did try. I mean, if you can get Voinovich and Kerry and Waxman in the same room, start talking about energy. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget our meeting in uh, Spain, where finally at the end of the week they said, "Okay, Voinovich, you remember they said nuclear is part of the the solution, but." <laughs> Not the, not the solution to it, but it's part of the, it's part of the solution. And, um, and China. Out of China came uh, several pieces of legislation that it hadn't been not for my participation uh, in those sessions on China would not have occurred. 
So it's been uh, it's been a good good run, and a lot of it's because of, of your organization. I really want to. This is a great organization. Well, thank you. I, we didn't actually bring you here to do a commercial, but we appreciate it. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Dick Clark, uh, former senator, runs our congressional program, which tends to do in-depth seminars with Bill Mel and others uh, on everything from Islam to arms control in a bipartisan way. Every now and then you see us get attacked because it says people take trips or something, but generally these are pretty intense seminars in places. And we keep it pretty quiet, and <coughs> you know, no lobbyists, no nobody else involved. I just wanted people to know what you were talking about when you talked about Dick's trip. So that's about it. And Walter, you know, I wrote to you and I said that there's some things that maybe you ought to be looking at. One of them is we're going to need help, and you are—I know you're already interested in and how we're going to deal with this uh, uh, debt that's not sustainable and budgets that are not balanced, as far as I can see. That's the, as far as I'm concerned. That's the number one problem facing the country. Period. I've only, and uh, by the way, I've only agreed to do one thing since I've, uh, Pete Peterson called me. I'm going to be on the Concord Coalition right. and the Committee uh, for a Responsible Budget work with Maya McGinnis. That's that's number one. After that, that's number one. Uh, Were you pretty surprised how uh, <coughs> strong the Simpson Bowles plan was? <coughs> yes, I was. In fact, I'm going to today or tomorrow get on the floor of the Senate and talk about the Patriots. Mm -hmm. I think they Including did. Including Coburn and? Yeah, Coburn and, and, and Crapo, and, and Judd, of course, has always been there. Yeah. Uh, Dick Durbin, uh, you know, there's some really good people there. What I'm afraid of, I was just I was talking to Kent on, uh, on Friday, I said, what, what I'm worried about is we've got this momentum going, and I think we may just lose it. And uh, anyhow. Do you, th do you think it's possible to do something right now on it, with Senator McConnell? Um, <coughs> I know this, that if, if, if nothing got done, in other words, we didn't extend them, as I said, all hell would break loose. That would put enormous pressure on us because the international markets would be looking at, everybody would look at it. It'd be a big, big deal. Is the uh, debt ceiling going to be another crisis moment? I think they'll use it, but it'll be, uh, I mean, it, they're going to use it as an, an issue, mm -hmm. but I think if you get up against it, I don't know how in the world you can say <laughs> you're not going to increase the debt ceiling. I mean, I got involved in that, uh, probably none of you know this, but, you know, at Christmas, uh, last Christmas, we were talking about uh, what we're going to do with the debt ceiling. The last vote was on whether the debt ceiling should go up, and, and I was urged by my colleagues to stick with the team, okay? The Democrats had the 60 votes. Let them get the let them get the votes. And I said it, it's not going to happen. I said Evan By will not vote for it. Period. He's you know, sometimes I get that way too. Sometimes senators get really ornery. They get mad at their colleagues, and they're going to show them. And that's exactly where Evan was at. So I said it's not going to happen. And I said, can you imagine leaving here and talking about? And they, there's a couple of months they could have gone, but the fact of the matter is the signal it would send to the international marketplace about our irresponsibility. They already think we're irresponsible. This is just, you know, uh, uh, re reaffirm the fact that, you know, and uh, so I was the 60th vote, yeah, no. and I'll never forget coming down on the on the elevator with Diane Feinstein. She said, "Well, she said we're going to have to come back. The president's going to call us back." I said, "Diane, I took care of you. Go home." <laughs> <laughs> but you can't. What I'm saying is the debt thing. We'll we'll talk it to death, <laughs> but the fact of the matter, when push comes to shove, we're going to have to increase it. There's just no. Now they can use it to say, "Well, we." to help use the pressure to, you know, keep spending. Now, all of us on the Appropriations Committee, I'm one of them, have said we can't spend any more than what we did uh, last time around. But uh, it, it, it's, it's another thing that would help us, yes. Before you go on, do you mind if we open it up a bit and stick on this issue for yep. a moment, yep. uh, both fiscal responsibility, debt, bipartisanship, and let me open it up to people who want to talk about that, and then we can move on to START or other foreign affairs treaties. Uh, yes. You don't have to, Larry, you don't have to raise your uh, thing. It's not Senator, it's not like Senator Clark. One of meeting. the most courageous things I did you was, was opposing uh, John Bolton uh, for the UN. Could you tell us what type of pressure you faced from your, your colleagues and from the White House on that, uh, on that issue? Uh, not a lot. Uh, because I know, uh, I got to know 
President Bush quite well. He was the governor, and he got to know me through that. And uh, <laughs> he knows I'm kind of bullheaded. <laughs> and uh, but I'm just saying that they didn't bother me. It's that, you know, I mean, uh, Condoleezza talked about it. Yes, we should go forward and, and that. But uh, um, there was. I, I have to admit. That, I mean, I. Well, I'll tell you when I had pressure on me was when. Uh, uh, Olympia and I, and uh, uh, was it John Bro and I think uh, uh, Max Block has got together to keep the president's tax uh, 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 increase back. You remember in two th th uh, 2003, and the president almost wanted a almost a trillion dollar reduction in taxes, and the House got it with 757, and and um, Olympia and I said no more than 350. And uh, I, that I got enormous pressure to, to say, you know, we want to do more than that. I mean, I, uh, I won't go into the details of it. That'll be a, a little something in my in my book. But uh, uh, I, I that I, I really did feel the, the pressure there. But they left me going uh, pretty much alone on both. And the other thing is that a lot of people on the on the um, foreign relations committee felt the way I did. I mean, I'll never forget that day because what uh, Chris Dodd and what John Kerry and Joe Biden were asking for was more time. Now, somebody thought that, uh, maybe some thought that this would, you know, con continue to delay the thing. But I think that really we hadn't given the committee enough time uh, for consideration on John. And I'd done a lot of background on him before the meeting. And I really felt that if we had not done that, it might have blown up. And maybe that's from my perspective, this bipartisan uh, uh, relationship that we had on the foreign relations. Because I have to tell you, the, 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 the Democrats were, I mean, they were mad. Joe was mad. I mean, some, I've never talked to Joe about it. But they were, they were upset. And, 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 and I couldn't believe that Dick Luger wouldn't give them more time. <laughs> and when we got to this vote, you, if you watch the meeting, and I'm going to try to get a, I'm sure there's some video of it, you could see that the heads of my colleagues kind of drooping. It was like, I don't want to do this, but, but <laughs> Luger says we should do it. And several of them afterwards said, one of them, and I won't mention who it is, said to me, if you hadn't done it, I'd have done it. Uh, but they didn't, I mean, because I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so you saved yeah. them to life. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Senator, uh, what advice would you what, what advice would you give um, those of us interested in energy policy and dealing with the next Congress? I realize that covers a lot of territory, but uh, what insights would you offer? Well, first of all, I've been on uh, EPW for now 12 years, and um, the basic problem that we've had is that uh, we have environmental, uh, we have business and others, but uh, we need to harmonize our environment our energy, our economy, and our national security. And get in a room and look at these things from, uh, from these perspectives to try to come up with something that, uh, that's, uh, that's doable. Uh, at this stage of the game, uh, I think that the most uh, constructive thing that will move us down uh, the field would be to pass a uh, really good energy efficiency piece of legislation, and uh, there's a good one um, in Bingaman's bill, uh, uh, that one that she worked with, uh, uh, with Murkowski. By the way, I'm so glad she's back. She's a great one. She, Lisa's a good, good solid person. Um, I think we also ought to uh, uh, do something about a renewable fuels formula uh, and include uh, uh, coal, clean coal, uh, and um, uh, we also ought to do the <coughs> nuclear part of this. Uh, uh, just do the doable. Just start moving down the field. Uh, the coal thing, uh, by the way, out of the Aspen Institute. You remember we had we were uh, there in, um, in Lanai, and we had that uh, Chinese American that was there, and he talked about uh, uh, what China was doing in terms of uh, of, of their environment. And then uh, Ken Leventhal did a paper about soft power with the Chinese. Here's a way to get some soft power going with the Chinese and working on, uh, on, uh, on energy. 
and uh, uh, and then uh, Joe Nye and uh, Armitage did another paper on soft power, but talked about how we could be working with the Chinese on something that we are both interested in. And uh, uh, we introduced this bill, and it's still in the committee. And Secretary of State's for it. Everybody is because it, it it's two hundred billion dollars, a million dollars a year, over five years. And, and the way the Asian Pacific Partnership works is that if we put in the money, the other countries have to uh, have to match it. And if any of you are inter interested in energy, if you look and see what that little Asian Pacific Partnership has done, it's done pretty good stuff. And I thought, here's a way we can work with China to get the job done. And, 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 uh, and that gets back to this issue of coal. When, and John Kerry was really good to me. He invited me to all the meetings. And, uh, and of course, I, he never answered this question. How much do you want to raise? Who's going to pay it? And who's going to get it? And I was, <laughs> Never, get, never got that answer. But he invited me to a meeting with, uh, uh, with Ban King Moon. And, and Moon was talking about the United Nations and doing something about, uh, about you know, cap and trade and so on and so forth. And I said to him, if, uh, if I were you, I would set up an international DARPA uh, to deal with uh, uh, clean coal technology. Because everyone knows we're going to be burning coal, and everyone knows that we're going to be emitting uh, these greenhouse gases. I mean, uh, India's building the biggest coal-fired facility. China's out buying up every bit of coal they can get their hands on. And we know that we're going to burn coal. And um, <laughs> the disconnect is in this country, the Sierra Club uh, uh, is, is closing, is fighting new coal facilities, even though they have integrated gas combined cycles. It's the best technology that's out there will allow some of the utilities to close down uh, their, the old, their, old, their old plants, so they're, they're shutting them down. And uh, it's like <laughs> China's over here doing their thing, India's doing their thing. It's like we're not, <laughs> the real world is this. If you really want to do something about greenhouse gas emissions, then you ought to <coughs> deal with the issue of clean coal technology and carbon capture and sequestration. And they say it's 10 years away. I'd say, I'd do everything I could to reduce that as quickly as we possibly can because I think it would probably have the most impact today on, um, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. What about a 25 cent gas tax right away? Well, I've come out for a 25 cent gas tax, but, a, but I, wanted, I want 15 cents of it to be used for uh, funding the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act, which in itself would help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It, it would, it, first of all, it would create jobs, it would deal with our infrastructure and greenhouse gas emissions. And then the other 10 cents would be used for deficit reduction. And others have done this uh, in the past. But for some reason, the president just does, does not want to, uh, to, to look at it. We, in fact, we haven't been able to get Ray LaHood, uh, uh, you know, uh, or Jimmy Oberstar has been working on this for two years. And unbeknownst to a lot of people, uh, I'm uh, one of the big four uh, in, in, in uh, Barbara's, uh, Barbara Boxer's committee. We've been working real hard. And, and, you know, the idea would be to get them, get the administration in, and, and get at least the contours of what the bill would look like. And when, uh, when uh, Reagan was president, 1982, I remember it because I was lobbying heck out of them because we were dying on the vine out in Cleveland. I said, you got to do something about jobs. And Drew Lewis did a real good job of getting everybody. Remember Lee? Drew got them all together. And then, the, and then Reagan came out. Do you remember? The, the, the Congress passed it in December, and, and, and Reagan signed a five cent increase in the gas tax. You remember that? And that, that I think, helped turn things. And then the emergency jobs bill. You remember that one? Yeah. And that, that helped. And, uh, and the thing that really drives me nuts is that all of the groups in this country, I'm talking about. Tom Donahue, I'm talking about John Engler, I'm talking about Bill Graves, I'm talking about the operating engineers, uh, our, uh, uh, all of the groups, all the private sector groups, if they were in this room and said, uh, are you willing to support the president's uh, proposal to increase the gas tax at least 10 cents? Now, now we've, got, we've got about a dozen of them on a letter to the commission mm -hmm. saying uh, yes. increase the gas tax uh, for our infrastructure. And it, the president, you know, He's, I'm, I'm just, I, I respect him, but where's the, where's the, you know, where's the beef? Where's the jobs? 
And you got a chance here to get everybody in the country together and say we're going to go forward and we are going to increase the gas tax and we're going to have a five-year robust reauthorization of the Service Transportation Act. Uh, we're going to do the environment, we're going to do jobs, we're going to do infrastructure, and, and we're going to put a segment of the economy to bed. All these states are backing off from uh, signing contracts. Uh, they, they won't do long terms. Uh, our contractors, many of them are out of business because their banks have cut off their line of credit or just they're wiped out. And if you want some certainty in the country, you say there's a big segment of the economy and let's do it and let's do it forthright. Let's not hide and say, well, we're going to increase the gas tax or gas on oil companies or gas companies. Let's do it straightforward. We're going to raise the gas the tax. It's been traditionally the way to do it. Here's where we're going to get out of it. Let's get on with it. Let's get going. And I can't understand it. No. That's all right. We don't need a little microphone. Okay. Um, I want to take you back to the larger debt issue, but also uh, the even larger problem uh, of uh, ungovernability in the country. Uh, the official positions of the two parties right now are basically the Democrats saying we only want to uh, dig the hole three trillion dollars deeper, and the Republicans uh, say we want it four trillion dollars deeper. That's before you start with any of the things that are in the uh, uh, commission. Uh, there are courageous people on the commission. All three House Republicans, of course, voted no, uh, and uh, the Republican leadership in the House, um, Eric Cantor, started by saying, we will not accept a dime of tax increase of any sort at any time ever. Um, we had in this Congress uh, for the first time uh, the most liberal Republican to the right of the most conservative Democrat. So we have no overlap whatsoever between the two parties. And uh, the signs after the election of coming together, uh, it seemed to me, uh, were rather ominous when I saw you and your 41 colleagues uh, all say you'd filibuster everything in the lame duck session until the tax issue was dealt with, which means by extending all of those tax cuts uh, and more, including the ones that were in the uh, stimulus package for a substantial period of time. Uh, on the debt limit, uh, you have a third of the Republican conference in the House that is new, and the vast majority of them have said they will never vote to increase the debt limit. Uh, and while you were, took that courageous position, um, how many of your colleagues, including the new ones coming in, do you think will? And where do you see signs beyond the uh, uh, external <laughs> efforts, a debt commission where you do get courage from people like Tom Coburn and Mike Crapo uh, and Dick Durbin, but inside, uh, I see a dynamic that uh, is a pretty grim one, including one where we may even exceed next year the number of cloture votes, uh, which were at an all-time record uh, this year. Well, first of all, in cloture votes, uh, Harry has filled the tree too much. And he ought to get back to uh, our regular order of business. You, you know, you come in there and he fills the tree, you can't get your amendments in, you're, you're going to, you know, I'm going to say, and, and a lot of those amendments, that I, you know, I, I supported, for example, this bill to help uh, small business and community banks. Uh, it was the 60th vote. Uh, everybody, all my people in Ohio, are, you know, they can't get any money from the banks. And uh, they're dying out there, and this is very, very important. Uh, but the big issue on that one was that uh, uh, we wanted four amendments Actually, we wanted seven, and then Harry said, if you get to seven, then I've got to have my amendments on stuff that's real important to my conference, like we're doing right now with, uh, with the DREAM Act and uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell and uh, a couple of other things. And, uh, and so I've tried to, to say to Mitch, these things have got to be relevant. I'm not, you know, I just, a couple of years ago, they just, it was just a lot of nonsense. And then, and then it was like, you put in your nonsense, we'll put in our nonsense. <laughs> and we wasted, just wasted time. So in this particular case, I went to Harry and I said, look, I'll tell you what, uh, give us one amendment, and that was on the, was it the 10, you know, that, that what is it, the, you know, the, the thing that you, 1099 thing, which is just ridiculous. And then you have one, I'll go along with this. And then, uh, and that's what they did. That's, so we got it done. So. Part, I'm just, that's background. There's got to be more openness on this. Uh, the other thing is that I'm as concerned about this as you are, Norm. I don't know where these people are. I remember when I first went to the state legislature, I won in a six-to-one Democrat district. And, you know, I'm looking around at 
know, shadows on the wall. And I mean, it's going to take these House members a while to settle down and find out who they are and what they are. And uh, so that's another thing that I'm worried about is that you're saying you're going to get tax reform. Uh, you're going to see some real uh, significant uh, changes in, in the tax expenditures and, and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure that it'll, it'll happen. And that's why I think if it looks like we don't do something and we're really going to go down the toilet, I mean, that, you're always going to need something to really shake them up and say, look, my God, you've got to do this. And you're going to hear it from everybody in their district. I don't care what you did to promise Grover Norquist that you weren't going to vote uh, for, uh, you know, you weren't going to increase taxes. And uh, I mean, I, to me, I'm going to tell you something. Anybody that would sign uh, signs that pledge, I mean, I've dealt with Grover a long time. But how in the world can somebody that's an elected representative give their proxy on this issue to somebody else? And I was glad that Coburn, I think he signed the pledge. Coburn said, you know, things have gotten to the point right now with the pledge, the, the pledge we need to make is to the people of America to do something about this, uh, this, uh, this problem that we have. That, that's what worries me. Uh, we're getting some good senators. I'll tell you, my, my, my replacement is going to be a great senator. Rob Portman is going to be a great, great senator. Uh, and there's some other people that are coming in that are really good on the Democratic side. And the real issue is, will those individuals kind of be able to kind of identify and come together and form a little group of people that are going to kind of help move this along? Or will they be too small to counteract the extremes on both uh, the What Democrats? caused the polarization? <laughs> too many House members. <laughs> I'm not true. I'm telling you. What happens is the House is so used to, you know, it's like the flavor of the month, something happens, bam, get out there and do it. And, and, there's, a, and there's a lot of, you know, partisanship over there. They, then they come over to the Senate and they carry their bad habits with them. Okay, so an issue comes up, instead of sitting back on it, kind of doing what a senator should do, think about it a little bit and everything else, bam, out there, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to get at it. And... Um, you know, some of them, they still remember battles from 10 years ago. It's like they're keeping score. I remember him from you know, 10 years ago. I said, what the hell? You're in the United States Senate today. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I, Norm, you're, you're the, you watch it. I, you know, you, the guys, if you look at the Senate today, the people that have been uh, mayors and governors and attorney generals and others who have had some management experience uh, are, are people that are more able to, to, to come together and get things done. And, and I'm not saying we don't have some great people that are senators that have been in, you know, in the House and uh, Chris Dodd, for instance, is leaving and uh, he, I thought he did a marvelous job in his, uh, in his uh, farewell address. Well, you know, Mr. Portman. And, yeah. yeah. And, uh, so anyhow, the point is that uh, uh, we, that gets to the other thing is about the, about the time we're spending raising money. I have to tell you that, uh, and I, some of you probably read his book, Lewis Gold. He's pretty, the most exclusive club. But I don't, I don't disagree with what he said in the book. You know, Twenty-five to twenty to twenty-five percent of a senator's time is spent on campaigning. I just met Al Franken in the airport in Cleveland. He was in there doing a, an event for, uh, for, uh, for, for uh, Brown uh, and uh, Sherrod Brown, and we were talking about it. You know. I'm so glad that I made up my mind two years ago that I, that I wasn't going to run. I've been able to be a senator for two years, honest to God, you know. I didn't take five committees, I took three. I've got two, three subcommittees. I've got one in probes, I've got one, I've got Tom Carper and I are, uh, have uh, uh, the uh, nuclear, clean air nuclear. Uh, and tomorrow we're going to have a summit, folks, on nuclear. Can you imagine that? That, uh, that Chu's going to be at and uh, Greg Yatsko is going to be at it, and Carol Browder is going to be there to try and look down the road and see what's the, what role is nuclear power uh, going to play in terms of all of these options that we have uh, to provide energy uh, you know, for our country. So, you know, three committees, uh, no fundraising, no fundraising uh, and uh, <laughs> you get to spend the time with we've had a decent... <laughs> David we've done some, de some <laughs> decent things. Yeah, we've done a lot of decent things. <laughs> we don't need the microphones. Yeah. I think we're all right. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, think I, got it. Right. Yeah. I want to thank you for, for everything you've done for our country. Uh, I was wondering what you thought about as we move towards 
thinking about the big pieces of our budget, we, we might concede that defense isn't as high as a percentage of GDP as it's been in the past. But what's your general view about where defense has to fit into our overall more than belt tightening that looks ahead? Well, I think that defense should participate, and always have. And uh, I'm a big believer in smart power. And uh, uh, we've been real uh, negligent on the soft power part of this. And I really thought, uh, and, and first of all, there, are, there is some progress that's being made on this. Uh, the guy that really first told me about you know, what he thought we should do was, was uh, General Jones. I uh, had a chance to spend an hour with him when we were in Brussels to, to kind of lay out what his dream was or what. I thought, gee, this guy should be in the <laughs> having something to say. And I think uh, Secretary of State um, uh, Clinton is, I think she's, I think she's doing a great job. Uh, and I think, and I think Gates gets it too. In fact, I think Gates, in anticipation of this happening, is you know, jaw boning, we got to be work harder and smarter, we got to look at stuff and everything else. It's got to be there. And if you, you know, if you take one uh, plane, for example, the cost of a plane, and look at what you could do with that money in terms of soft power, it's just amazing. So I think these are some of the things that need to be looked at. Here's we're spending money over here. But I have to tell you, there are a whole lot of people out here that want us to spend as much money on defense as possible. That's another thing. You know, Eisenhower, and I honest to God believe it's just a, the, the, the military uh, industrial complex and, and it's add a third factor, the political. <laughs> and uh, I just worry, you know, I, what I'm saying is that, and we did the F-22 and we, you know, there's some differences of opinion about it. But I, I just think that you have to sit down and look at things from a cost benefit point of view. Uh, the State Department, frankly, needs more people. I mean, I, I have to say, I got really involved with that, with, with Colin Powell. I mean, Colin Powell, if anybody, and, and uh, uh, what's it, his, his right-hand man, Armitage. Armitage, Richard. Yeah, they did a heck of a job. I mean, they really did. They brought back Esprit Accord, the State Department. Colin's a great manager. He went out there and, and, and you know, uh, talked to the people and got them all fired up. And then I, you know, I, and I, I'm not saying anything out of school. I told Condoleezza I, when, when, when she put uh, Bob Zellick over there, I said, what? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's not a management guy. I said, who's going to do the management? You know, and then uh, Negroponte, and I, I, John comes in, I'm talking to him. I said, well, what's your, what's your, uh, what, what, what's she asking you to do? Well, I'm going to do this. I said, what about the management? Who's going to do the management? And then we had Henrietta. Holtzman for uh, Yeah, she's a great lady, but, um, I think the model that was set up with having Steinberg over here and then we had Jack Lou over here is the best model. Uh, you got to, uh, you know, somebody's got to pay attention to, to the management side of this thing. And, uh, uh, you know, this, this locational pay for people in, the, in mm. the State Department has been a real big issue. We've we, we got it taken care of by last year or hopefully this budget will get taken care of. We'll take care of it this year. But I, I asked John Kerry, we ought to get this thing, this issue taken. Uh, uh, taken care of, but we, I'm just saying, it, it, we really need to look at the big picture here and decide what, where we should spend our money. And I think that we'll get a big bang, I think, uh, out of uh, soft power. Mm -hmm. Was it, oh yeah, Secretary Coleman. First, I want to thank you for the great work you've done. Even though you leaving the Senate, I private sector could be doing today, which is much better than the way the government does it? About the question is whether or not you know anything the private sector is doing do that the government could uh, learn from. I do my better. If you have any problem, the whole freight railroad system, there's no reason why the federal government should be involved in that at all. Yeah. What well, here, here's what I've done. When I became, when I ran for mayor of Cleveland, I was lieutenant governor, and this lady and I thought we were on our way. I was going to be the next governor. <laughs> so the business community asked me to come back to Cleveland. And I told Delta Wynn, who ran Eaton, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. After we really thought about it, didn't we, dear? 
She says, what do you want to do that for? <laughs> it's the only time in my whole life that she had some question about what we were doing. <laughs> but I told DeWin, I said, uh, number one, I don't want to worry about campaign fin financing. I don't want to bother with that. You guys take care of it. And I said, second of all, more important than that, I want you to do an honest-to-God management audit of our city. I said, I'm not going to be like the rest of the mayors to have these problems just keep smacking me in the face, smacking me in the face, smacking me in the face. And I will tell you that we, they put together an unbelievable, we call it an operations improvement task force. And they came in and they spent three months. And I'm not, I'm talking about not, you know, these were top notch. Why do I keep, do weekly reports? Because the, the, the guys that were the assistant to major uh, chairman of corporations said this is what their boss did in order to keep track of what was going on in the organization. Uh, and they did a great job. And they came back with recommendations. And the really interesting thing is this, that most of the recommendations came from the people that were already there. Mm -hmm. But nobody listened to them. And what happened was is they folded in these recommendations as, as to their, all of them. So some of the people said, you know what, somebody actually was listening to us and had other ideas. And then we had, we monitored the hell out of it. And in fact, and then the, the business community was so happy with the fact that we were going forward with the recommendations that we created something called MOVE, the Mayor's Operation Volunteer App. And I had one person in that office that they paid for. But if I had a, I had a problem, I did not hire a consulting firm. We just call one of the businesses and say, we got a problem here. I, we had one in motor vehicle maintenance. Uh, real good commissioner, you couldn't fire him. Nice guy, but <laughs> didn't know anything about it. So the, the gas company gave me a guy for a year, top guy to come over and work with him, put it in a computerized uh, inventory system. The, the answer, Bill, is that, is that I think that we need to bring in, to, to go to the private sector. And, um, you know, it's just like, uh, Supply chain management was is something I've been working on like for seven years. You know, uh, Rumsfeld said we're losing $27 billion. Uh, when the Iraq war started, uh, the, the Defense Department was buying stuff uh, that they were selling in surplus. Uh, I mean, they didn't know where anything was. <laughs> and so they started going to places like uh, Walmart and others to find out how you do this. And one of the best days, I get goosebumps, I'm in Iraq, and you got General Cohn and a German guy, German general. I mean, it's a guy, German last name. It's Klaus, who was your general? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, anyhow, these two, no, this is, this is, and, and uh, 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 the, the top guy was t uh, taking a week's break, which he needed. But anyhow, they were telling us about how they were moving stuff out of Iraq. And it was absolutely fantastic. They knew where the stuff was. They knew what they were sending to Afghanistan. They knew what they were going to keep in Iraq. They knew the stuff they were going to send back to the United States. And they, had, they, know where every, they knew where everything was. It, to me, it was like, well, maybe something good has happened in terms of, of, of that. But I think a lot of the ideas uh, came from the private sector about what they ought to do. A lot of the systems that we have today in the federal government are outdated. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a problem that there's no uh, person who's run a business um, in the administration in a high position? And if so, what causes that? Was that because Obama didn't appoint one, or because if you're in business now, it's just kind of hard to go into government? Well, uh, one thing is that we really have to, you know, uh, we have to really and of course the economy is bad now. We, we, have, we have to go after trying to get the very best and bright people. Uh, uh, Zion sits over at OMB, uh, mm -hmm. good guy. I said what you guys should be doing is you ought to be picking the areas where we need uh, people in acquisition and other areas because there's a lot of bright people out there and we ought to go out there and really have a program that just go after those people, get them in the federal government. They're going to probably get less money than they could have in the private sector, but they may find out that they like it. And we, you know, and we have, so we do have to do a much better job of, of, of bringing in good people. And second of all, you know, there's been a lot of articles. Is this thing manageable anymore? I mean, mm -hmm. with, today with uh, all the problems, and, and there ought to be just somebody that, and that, it's like, I you know, Lee, you're, you can maybe give, you know, you got the chief of staff but the chief of staff is like putting out fires all the time. And I remember when I was governor, I had a, I remember Paul Mipson was my chief of staff. Paul, he was great. But I concluded almost immediately that I needed somebody 
that was just going to work on management day in and day out and day in and day out and day in and day out and just stay with that and no matter what fire was out there they'd still keep working on on the stuff that that, that matters and I think that uh, that we don't we don't we don't do enough of that uh, yeah. I don't think you're that, right Jeff Zions is good be he's, nice a, he's, yeah. he, he's great he, yeah. uh, Clay ja uh, Johnson was a good guy uh, and he really tried uh, but Jeff has Jeff's really done. John Barry, the guy in, in Office of Personal Management, John's a terrific guy. I think he's one of the best that uh, mm -hmm. that I've seen over there. And so, Tom Nides is coming in at State, right? Well, I, I'm not, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, so th so that's we have to get it's the it's the management mm -hmm. side of this that, that we have to get uh, hands on. Yeah. Judge Webster. John Barry, <coughs> thanks for a great job. Well done. If, speaking of management, <clears throat> if you had a magic wand, what would you do about the confirmation process? Well, first of all, I would exempt a bunch of people. Now, let me tell you, we almost did it. Uh, and Harry was involved and McConnell was involved. We met in, uh, what was McConnell? Was a, he was a second in command, wasn't he? Anyhow, we all agreed that we were going to get, eliminate a bunch of this stuff, that, that's, that we shouldn't do it. And we were almost there, and then what happened is Harry ran for leadership and Mitch ran for leadership. And a lot of the people who like to have these people under their thumb for a while were unhappy about it, and so the thing disappeared. And it, and it should be revisited. It's, and and it, the work's already done. If somebody put their mind to it, we could get rid of a lot of these folks that should not have to come to the Senate for confirmation. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I, I'm guilty in some instances. I mean, I, I, I had a big battle over uh, in Homeland Security. Uh, they wanted to hire this guy. I, I got the law amended so that we'd have somebody in uh, Homeland Security that would be in charge of, of uh, transformation. You know, it's like I talked, having somebody get up every day, transformation, transformation, because, you know, put, putting those agencies together, that's never should have been done in the first place, and I don't know if it'll ever get done, but you need to have somebody working on it. And I felt this guy wasn't qualified for the job, so I put a hold on him. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they finally gave him a, a, a recess uh, appointment. But, I mean, occasionally, I, but I'm just saying overall, uh, Let's clean it up. But your hold was public and for a reason. Oh, like I have never had a hold that I haven't publicly said, I'm holding them, and here is a reason should, why I'm Should that be a small change that's made? Or? Well, I think, I, I think it should. Okay. Other questions? Let me do start, if I may. Is there any way to get um, Senator Kyle to agree to a start uh, treaty during the lame duck? <coughs> Well, first of all, I, I think uh, we should uh, congratulate the administration for being responsive to John's concerns. But I pointed out the other day to the gang uh, that Pete Domenici, five years ago, was, was calling for modernization uh, of uh, our nuclear, uh, and, uh, and everybody ignored them, or ignored him. So, in effect, he indicated, you know, we need to do something. We're now, now we're doing it. Uh, I think for the most part they've satisfied uh, the, the, uh, that part of it. I think the biggest problem we have today among a lot of senators uh, is the issue of missile defense. And uh, uh, the rumor on the street, and it's being, and it's got to be, and we've got to snuff it out, is that there, a deal was made because we know the Russians are so. Uh, unhappy about missile defense that we had a kind of wishy-wash on it in the preamble. And everybody you talk to, all of the, the leaders of the countries, including you know, our leaders, have said, we're not wishy-washy, we just happen that, and, and, it's, and it's not involved. But there's a lot of people out there that's saying it is involved. And I think that uh, one of the things, one of the best things a president could do right now is make it clear that we're going forward with our missile defense system to be able to uh, develop and deploy a missile defense system that's capable of defending the United States. Now, we're taking care 
of uh, the Europeans, although uh, some have told me that it doesn't do anything with their uh, tactical uh, nuclear uh, wherewithal, and a lot of the Europeans are concerned. Well, most people would like to see this thing get done. It's modest. The verification's a little bit, in my opinion, a little bit less than what we had And before. most people include you strongly, right? Pardon? You, you strongly want to get it done. I'd like to get it done. I, I, I'd like to get it done, but I'm just saying there are th these things, impediments, a little bit about verification, but the big issue today that ought to be dealt with as soon as possible before this thing gets a run and gets legs is this issue of this missile defense system. It's got to be clear. If the president would say, look, we're going forward with it, and, you know, Putin says if you do this and all, let them do whatever they want to do. Just say, we're going forward with, with, with what, we, what we need to do. And uh, uh, I think then I think there's going to be a lot of people that are out there saying we got to lay this thing away because, you know, we're not going to be able to, you know. If he said we're going to go ahead with a missile defense system that would include what the European allies yeah. want and what we want, do you think Senator Kyle, Senator McConnell, and others would schedule a vote on this in lame duck? I think it would move it up. Okay. Yeah, I think it would. I, I really do. I think it would help move the ball down the field. Yeah. Any further thoughts, questions? All right. Was there any uh, before we end? Uh, did we get everything on your list? And if not, uh, what campaign, else? campaign finance reform. Campaign finance reform. We'll do a whole lunch on that one. Yeah. Senator Voinovich, great pleasure. Thank you, Thank sir. You.